Our friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So I got some good news. We just opened up a new merchandise store, and the good thing about this new merchandise store is that things are cheaper in it. So if you guys want to purchase the Generation Tech shirt or one of our Humanity First shirts, if you're into the movement, uh, please check the links down below. Now on to the episode. Imagine you're chilling at your desk watching the latest episode of Generation Tech and all of a sudden you start hearing a voice in the back of your head telling you that you have to kill your boss. Let's just call him Steve. And moments later you're standing over Steve's lifeless body, satisfied with your work and ready to go back to whatever you were doing before. That is essentially what happened during the Clone Wars, but on a massive scale. Thanks to some very brilliant bioengineering done by the Kaminoan cloners. They used a small bioorganic device known as an inhibitor chip to control the behavior of all of their soldiers. Today we're going to try to figure out how the inhibitor chip works by exploring some of the lore and history of the inhibitor chip, and then also looking at some real-life technology and practices we have here on Earth. From the beginning, the idea of the inhibitor chip was something that Jedi Master sifo supported. Like any mass-produced weapon, the Jedi agreed that some safety device needed to be put in place in order to prevent the clone troopers from falling into the wrong hands. Primarily, the Jedi Master wanted an inhibitor chip to prevent any rogue Jedi or Sith from taking over the entire army. But eventually, Count Dooku, at the behest of Darth Sidious, alters this inhibitor chip to do much more than just prevent a hostile takeover from a Force user. The clone army was genetically designed to be obedient and follow orders, so naturally its creators were afraid that they could wind up under the command of the wrong people. According to Legends, there were over 150 orders that dealt with all types of scenarios. There was Order 4, which stated, In the event of the Chancellor being incapacitated, overall GR command should fall to the Vice Chair of the Senate until a successor is appointed or alternative authority is identified. Then there was Order 5. In the event of the Chancellor being declared unfit to issue orders, as defined in Section 6, the Chief of the Defense Staff shall assume JR command and form a strategic cell of senior officers until a successor is appointed or alternative authority identified. Now, these are more traditional directives that dealt with the succession of chain of command in the event the Supreme Commander could no longer be in charge. It's kind of similar to the United States' own line of succession for the president. The difference, of course, is that in our own country, the articles that cover this information lie within the U.S. Constitution, whereas in the Republic, these orders are literally stamped into their soldiers' brains. This sets up the Grand Army of Republic to be an equal, if not more powerful, counterpart to the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Similar to the militaries of countries like Egypt or Thailand. This means, of course, democracy is always under the threat of a military coup. And then there's Order 65, which is quite interesting. In the event a majority of the Senate or Security Council declares the Supreme Commander to be unfit to issue orders, an authenticated order being received by the GAR Commander shall be authorized to detain the Supreme Commander with lethal force if necessary, and the command of the GAR should fall to the Acting Chancellor until a successor is appointed or alternative authority identified as outlined in Section 6. In our own country, we have articles on presidential impeachment and removal from office written into the Constitution. Next up is Order 37, and that focuses on something a bit different. It enables the capture of a single wanted individual through the mass arrest and threatened execution of a civilian populace. Follow-up directives included scenarios for body disposal of civilian casualties and suppression of communications. So Order 37 is a bit different, it's more of a military protocol, or in this case, a lack of protocol. Typically most militaries, even ones that do commit war crimes and horrendous acts of violence against civilians, won't have these actions sanctioned through written language. Usually their actions are the results of breaking protocol. But for some reason the JR does actually have these things programmed as an option. Which again speaks to how problematic and dangerous the JR actually is. And lastly of course we have Order 66 which led to the execution of all the Jedi. So as we can see the 150 orders all are designed to handle a variety of situations. Our own military is subject to similar types of rules but what made the 150 orders more dangerous was how they were executed through the inhibitor chip. As we mentioned before, these were biochips that were physically inserted into the brains of clone troopers. They were more or less undetectable. As a matter of fact, when one malfunctioned, a medical droid misdiagnosed the chip as a tumor. Because these chips were organic, they grew along with the host. The chips were first installed in the third stage of embryonic development. Now, there have been some variations on how control chips work, but the chips used on the clones seem to put the soldiers in a trance-like mode where their personality completely changes, and they robotically carry out whatever order is given to them. 
Now, given that the clones are just human beings, just like humans here on Earth, what the inhibitor chip is actually doing is very similar to hypnosis. Hypnosis alters our state of mind and decreases activity in the left-hand side of the brain, which we attribute to logic. At the same time, our right side of the brain, or creative side, becomes more active. When this happens, our consciousness shuts down and our subconscious takes over. Our subconscious is the part of our mind that directly influences all of our actions. Our subconscious is directly affected by our own experiences in a very unfiltered way. While we might try to suppress strong feelings or emotions and stress from our conscious awareness, our subconscious will soak up everything else and eventually those feelings and emotions will surface. Because our subconscious drives our conscious actions in order to affect great change in an individual, the subconscious must be reprogrammed. And since our subconscious is not analytical or logical, it's much easier to do. Now this inhibitor chip is clearly beyond any technology we have today, but essentially it could function by limiting activity in certain parts of the brain to create a trance and activate hidden programming. And again, because these individual subconscious has taken over, their analytical brain is shut down. This allows clones to kill their Jedi generals without any emotional attachment. This kind of programming is even more apparent when we look at the case of Tup, a clone trooper whose inhibitor chip prematurely kicked off Order, Order 66. As his chip started going off, Tup started going into a trance and became overly aggressive against the Jedi. Eventually, Tup does kill a Jedi, but he does it in a very aggressive manner. He's not very calm. This essentially means that the chip is somehow associating the Jedi with very negative images and conditioning Tup to essentially hate Jedi and want to kill them. After Tup kills the Jedi, the chip continues to malfunction, forcing him to become increasingly aggressive and exhibit psychotic behavior. After scanning Tup, they found that the chip was blocking certain neural impulses in the brain. Upon removing the chip from Tup's brain, he finally begins to return to normal, and he talks about having a dream that supposedly every clone has. It's a mission of some sort that is obviously very unpleasant. Tup calls it a nightmare. But now with the chip removed, that nightmare has finally ended, or so he says. This again shows signs of subconscious programming, Perhaps this nightmare that the clones are having was specifically programmed into their brains in order to reinforce Order 66. Now, there have been other types of inhibitor chips used in Star Wars. The Empire used a similar chip on Wookiee slaves during the occupation of Kashyyyk. But because these chips were not installed at birth, they functioned a bit differently. Whenever a Wookiee acted out or disobeyed an Imperial, the chip would send immense pain to the Wookiee's brain. The chip is so powerful that it could even be used to kill an adult Wookiee. So obviously the technology in these control chips are a little bit rudimentary and easier to detect and more crude. The clone inhibitor chips were definitely next level technology. Well guys, that's our video about how inhibitor chips work. I really think this is an interesting device. It really defines what the clone troopers uh, actually were. And also it shows us this secret uh, power dynamic in the Republic. Uh, you know, Palpatine being the only one who knew about these 150 orders had a really huge amount of power, you know, despite what the Senate or the populace actually thought. Well, guys, thanks for joining us today. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.